hi, Justin. Uh, hi, Renee. <laughs> so I'll start with the question I ask everybody. Do you consider yourself to be a data scientist? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, I suppose since you invited me on, it sort of makes me a data scientist. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that a lot of, uh, you know, in academia, you know, I think a lot of times when we run into the, the phrase data science, um, people raise their eyebrows a little bit because they say, well, you know, aren't we all scientists working with data? Aren't we like by default data scientists? And so to a certain extent, having spent a lot of time working with data, um, that, that gets me part of the way there. But more so, I feel like when people talk about data science, you're really talking about you're partly talking about applying those the those skills to business questions often, um, but also more specifically, there are um, because of that there are sets of tools that have been developed in industry, fairly specific to industries issues and industries um, problems and the types of data that that is worked with. So, um, you know, the extent to which I I know all of the ins and outs of those tools, I think might not make me as much of a data scientist as most people think about when they when they say data science. OK, so we'll come back later to what you do now. Yeah. Um, but first, let's go back to your childhood. So did you like science and tech as a kid, or did you start programming early, or anything that would um, make somebody think that you would eventually become a data scientist? Yeah, I so my first, my first time programming, I did have access to a computer. And I still remember my, I had a teacher that that had noted that I was good at math. So he wanted me to like write this program in basic or something. And um, I ended up just kind of wrote copying um, just out of the back of the textbook, some basic program. And I had no idea what it was. And I had no, I, I had no understanding of it whatsoever. And what grade was um, that in? That was fifth grade. Uh -huh. um, and so I had, that was my, probably my, my first <laughs> foray into programming. Um, but after that, you know, once I got into into middle school, I ended up being really good at math. So I, you know, like skipped a grade of math in middle school, and um, when I got to high school, I started, you know, this messing around with HTML and had a little got a little summer internship at Intel, doing um, like building a little intranet website or something for a, an engineering group. Oh, wow. um, so there were these like little, you know, little things that that I kind of started doing some some web stuff on on one side, and then on the other side, I loved physics and and was was really good at math in high school. So those were probably the the like early indicators of of where I might end up one day. So did you take AP classes in high school? Yeah. So this was this was with the yeah the AP calculus track, the AP physics. Um, all of that fun stuff. So in high school, I, I had actually maxed out. I hit did because I had skipped ahead a year. So I was doing AP. I finished up the second year of AP Calc junior year. Um, and in my senior year, in, I had basically decided that I wanted to be a band instructor and didn't want to have anything to do with, with science or, or <laughs> engineering or anything at all. My senior year, I basically like shut down all of my advanced academic stuff because I would have had to like go to the community college or something um, and focused almost entirely on music and um, in order to try to get into into a music program for college. Okay, so uh, where did you decide to go to college and did you know right away that you wanted to uh, major in a music program? Yeah, so I went to um, I was at Arizona State University um, and got into the oboe studio there. Um, and yeah, I was, I was completely 100% committed to a career as a, as a musician. Um, I, uh, started out in, uh, as to do music education, to be a band instructor. My first week of class, I actually changed majors. That was my first time changing majors <laughs> in, in undergrad. your first week? Wow. My very so first week. So what triggered that? What triggered that? I so there was uh, I tr changed into a different program called music therapy, um, which uses music as a as a therapeutic tool. And I had a friend who was doing music therapy, and Arizona State was is one of the handful of uh, universities that have music therapy programs. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the, that was the my first trigger is that I wanted to I decided I wanted to do music therapy, um, and that was you know in part due to the fascination with what you know 
how it works, you know, the, the effects that music can have on, on the body, on the psyche. Um, that's what, that's what that first, uh, that first change was. So did classes in that area start leading you towards neuroscience? Um, not really. I think what, what led me towards neuroscience then was a little bit of a frustration with, with music therapy in that it's, um, at the time, at least, I, I'm not exactly sure how things are looking now because I've been out of it for a while. But at the time, a lot of what I was being taught was didn't there wasn't much explanation as to why a certain therapy or why something worked. And I was really feeling frustrated with like not understanding the reasons that things were happening. Um, that combined with it being really hard to be a musician. I mean, I was what 18 years old and practicing like my oboe two to three hours a day and sitting there scraping and making reads two to three hours a day like the level of focus and dedication that was that was necessary for that pro kind of program was just not for me so by the end of that first year i basically threw my hands up and i was like this music stuff is too hard i'm gonna go do something that i am probably better at and i switched to engineering um, and that was my uh so yeah, so I bailed into engineering, decided I was going to design. <laughs> I don't think many people bail into engineering. No, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, how was that taken? That was fine. I mean, luckily I was on, a, I was funded on a scholarship that it didn't really matter. Um, I could, I could, I could switch. Luckily I was at a, at a very large university with, um, with a lot of room for, for flexibility. Um, so, I mean, it kind of set me back a year in, in that, you know, nothing overlapped, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a bad deal. So, so I switched into engineering, decided I wanted to be a, a race car designer. I loved cars and trucks uh, when I was in in high school and decided I was going to design race cars. So I switched into mechanical engineering, spent some time, um, you know, started learning basic engineering stuff. Um, and then there was a there was a talk, uh, a, a seminar that had been organized. It was like music and the brain or something like this. And it was a, it was, it had been organized largely by the music therapy program. Um, but there were a couple of bioengineering professors at, U, at Arizona state that were involved because they were bioengineers who were interested in using mu and understanding music and, um, in the context of, of motor control and, and how the brain works. And so that was my first indicator that actually there might be a different way for me to approach these like, the, this interest and in how how music and the brain interact, and so at that point I switched into bioengineering at the end of my second year, um, which is a pretty much easier segue from mechanical. Um, and then basically spent undergrad getting involved in research projects dealing with music and and auditory perception. So, what kind of courses were available to you um, at the high level there in the undergrad? Yeah, so a lot of the so the courses that I was um, basically the kind of the required track was your standard set of calculus, uh, linear algebra course. Um, and then in the context of biomedical engineering, there were some courses that were dealing more with, um, with more partial derivatives, um, and such, you know, in the context of fluid mechanics and, you know, various types of, of engineering analyses, you know, analyzing um uh, blood flow and and transport of molecules across membranes and um and things along those lines that were were fairly applied versions of of mathematical um differential equations basically and was the psychology of perception or anything like that included in that or was it pu like purely a you know research yeah. track from the that you know, was mathematical all side? of all of that stuff was was purely i learned purely on the pretty much pre purely on the research side um so a lot of that was by getting involved in research projects i did a summer um a summer project out in um in boston the nsf has these um REU programs, this like research experience for undergraduates. Um, so I got into an REU program in Boston um, with an auditory perception. That was probably my first time really getting into programming, I would say. Like I had been doing HTML, I had been kind of messing around with websites and such up until then. That summer was when I really, that was my first time personally running um, uh, and des designing and running some you know, psychology experiments. 
um, some perception experiments. And that was also my first time really programming stuff up in MATLAB. So the whole experiment had to be programmed up in MATLAB and the analysis was all done in MATLAB. Um, and so that was that was definitely some on the job training, working with the senior, with the graduate students that were mentoring me um, and, and needing to get my project done um, was where I had started to really learn that kind of stuff. And what did the data look like that you were working with at that point? Yeah, that stuff was, so that data was a, there were kind of two data sets. One was, so what we were doing is we were, um, the, the lab was interested in the, the influence of echoes on our ability to localize sound. So the two sides hmm. of that project was, um, I was basically dealing with stuff that other people had written in order to capture um, the echoic environment of a room. Um, so what that largely consisted of was me setting up this little, this little uh, mannequin, uh, this little dummy with um, with microphones in its ears, um, hmm. and then moving a speaker around a room and playing uh, this just white noise, this sound, um, in order to capture what all the echoes uh, did to that sound by the time it got to to the ear, um, wow. and then. What's, what's cool with that is you can take that transformation that it does with the white noise, then you can take any new stimulus, any new sound that you've recorded, do that convolution again, and if you play that back in phones, it now sounds like you're sitting in that room and whatever audio was played came from that location in the room. Um, That's so really that was, interesting because it's hard to imagine that white noise has a very clear echo. I mean, I guess a computer p would pick it up, but it would just sound like more white noise. You wouldn't hear, you know, exactly. necessarily like the, the start and stop of the sound. Exactly. But because you can, because you can analyze this in the computer, what you can look for is the, you know, because white noise is, is completely flat and is, has no regularities in it, but that transformation between the echoes and the transformation that the, that the dummy, the, the mannequin's ears made um, is, is uh, a um, you know those regularities can be picked up, and so you can you can reverse and and reverse out the math and in order to identify what that um, what that matrix matrix is that does that transformation. So did you go um, right into grad school out of undergrad? Uh, I actually took a I did not I um, I was going to and my wife got a Fulbright to Egypt. And so I had already been accepted into into grad school, and so I took a year. I deferred for a year, and got to go to Egypt and do whatever I wanted to out there. Nice. Um, yeah. So did you collect data while you were there? <laughs> no, I actually. So what I did while I was there is I, I actually got involved when I was in. So in undergrad, I was involved in organizing a. Um, I started a nonprofit with some friends. Um, so I had some friends that were very active in refugee resettlement, um, and I helped them out with website stuff and getting technical things set up. And one of the projects we had done in undergrad in Arizona was um, mapping. We had, we basically had volunteers that worked with newly resettled refugees to kind of help them get a lay of the a lay of the land, and. So we put together a map of resources in the Phoenix area um, to help our volunteers and the and the refugees kind of find critical services. Um, and so that was sort of my first data science product, um, you know, because we were basically taking data that we had compiled and, and pushing it into an online uh, forum for people to use. Um, yeah. But I had so I had worked with them and then I got out to Egypt and this was a little bit after the, then I want to say, um, there was a very violent election in Kenya, and a group called Ushahidi had started a system for reporting election violence with SMS reporting. Um, so you could send a text message and, of uh, reporting violence in your location, and then volunteers would would kind of process that and put it on a map. By the time mm -hmm. I got to Egypt, they had. Um, this was an open platform. And so I worked with, I coordinated between some uh, uh, women's organizations in Egypt and my friends out in the States who had done, um, who had done mapping stuff to, in order to 
put together a uh, service where women in Egypt would be able to report uh, sexual harassment on the street um, using the Ushahidi platform. And it was a big, big deal at the time, especially because when I when I first got there to Egypt, uh, Suzanne Mubarak had just, um, who was who was Mubarak's wife, had just made a big statement about how there is no um, there is no sexual harassment on the streets in Egypt. Huh. Um, and a lot of these women's organizations were were you know protesting. They had just released this big uh, survey um, highlighting that this was the the fact. And so this was meant to be a you know kind of a call to kind of give voice to to um, to give voice to those experiences in a in a digital way. Um, so that organization um, is actually now they're doing awesome. It's completely Egyptian run now. So that's Harass Map. Is the is the organization and and they're doing super cool things in Egypt since then. Wow, that's neat. I'll have to link to that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, what did you do when you got back from Egypt? Uh, got back from Egypt and and started into my PhD. So I uh, joined a lab um, where we uh, look at auditory perception in European starlings. Um, so European starlings are birds that um, not only learn their song, they don't only learn how to how to sing their song, but they can also use, listen to each other and can recognize each other according to the songs that they sing. Um, and so, are, are these, so you said European starlings, but are these the same yeah. starlings that we're used to here in America that, you know, are considered invasive and create big flocks yeah. and noise yeah. and stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly so ones. did yeah. they study them just because they were, um, you know, readily available to study? What was the reason of choosing starlings? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a part, you know, that, that certainly helps things. Um, and, uh, but also they're, they're very smart birds. Um, they're very, um, so they sing these songs that um, that can last that are very long, um, and so and they continue to incorporate new elements into their songs throughout adulthood. Um, and they have and because of this rich repertoire, one of the things that my you know my advisor had done a few years prior was actually to show that they rely on you know that on on the sequencing and that there's they can identify um, some aspects of. Uh, recursive structures in syntax. Um, and so basically what we're able to do with the starlings is that we can train them up um, to uh, discriminate between different things. So we can uh, train them so that when they uh, when they want a little bit of food, they peck on a, on a port, um, they'll hear a song, and then they have to make a decision whether to peck left or peck right in order to get the food. Um, and by doing this, just through trial and error, they can learn uh, various associations. So we can do this both to try to kind of do an experimental psychology approach and understand what it is they can and can do. Um, once we train them up on things, we can then you know, present new stimuli and see how they categorize them in order to kind of, you know, in, the, in kind of a data science framework as a, as a validation cross set or if you've you know, if you've trained a clustering algorithm on on one particular set of data and then you provide novel elements to it you know how do you how, what what does it do um, and so we can we can kind of do do similar things with the with the starlings and and probe them in similar ways so you're playing a song and they have to decide whether that song means left or right button yep exactly you can use a bunch exactly. of different songs to figure out what can they distinguish between yeah. So, so my so for example, my project specifically, I have uh, I've trained starlings to respond based on the sequence that they hear. So if they, um, so I take little excerpts of a different starling song. Um, you can kind of think of these as like words, maybe. Um, so these are little elements, and if they hear one element by itself, that wouldn't give them any information. So if they hear element A, that doesn't give them any information. If they hear A, B, then that gives them a little bit of information they should go left. If they hear A, B, C, that gives them a little bit more information that they should go left. If they hear B, A, that means they should go right. Um, so so by, by manipulating these and manipulating these contingencies, I can train them that this is, you know, that these are the, that, that A to B to C means that you should probably go right. C to B to A means you should probably go left. 
Um, and how long does it take to train them? It depends on the it depends on the task. So that's um, you know sometimes the the difficulty in training is just figuring out how to train them exactly. Um, you know if you look at at uh, at I feel like some of the machine learning people are starting to do this kind of stuff too. So like the you know sometimes there is uh, there's shaping procedures that we have to do in order to like you know where you start them out with a fairly easy and then you get it more and more and more difficult. Um, and so it depends. So they'll learn it in a couple of days. Some tasks it takes them a little bit longer. So, okay. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about this and this is a audio podcast, let's see if we can <laughs> listen to some Starling songs. So yeah. um, I have the um, page pulled up from Cornell Ornithology. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, I don't know for sure if I'm legally allowed to use these yet, so these songs might get replaced later. <laughs> no problem. But but I'm assuming they're um, available, so I'll give them attribution. Um, but they have a song here that um, is 17 seconds long, and I don't know if you want to tell us something about this song or the type of um, the ways that you could use you know some some audio like this and, yeah. and break it up or what kind of patterns you hear. So tell me if you can hear this when I play it. All right. Can you hear that? No. Okay. So Sadly. I don't know if I have this routed, so you can do that. Well, okay, so why don't we do this? Um, if you could give us some song samples that you have later on, yeah. and I can integrate them into the show. Perfect. I can okay. do that. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, I would love to listen to it. And if you could just describe each of the samples and you know what it might be used for in your research. Yeah. Um, do, do you want me to describe it right now? Yeah, sure. If you want to, yeah. I, yeah I, so I, so I guess so. I'll, I'll probably play you a song. But one of the things that you'll be able to hear, um, one of the things you're going to hear is that they um, that there are are repeating elements, and they're incredibly complex songs. So there's a lot of high frequencies, a lot of low frequencies. There's these clicky sounds that um, that that sound uh, kind of weird and scratchy. Um, but importantly. Um, the, the sounds that you hear in the beginning of the song are different than the sounds that you hear in the back. Um, and they tend to repeat these like these complex chunks over and over again. Uh, and so those those kinds of complex chunks are these are these key elements that um, they tend to rely on in in kind of constructing new songs for them. And it's interesting to me that you are researching what the starlings are listening to and responding to, because I was thinking that you were going to be training the starlings to produce a certain song. So yeah. um, did you go in that direction because it's easier to study because it's like an A-B test instead of trying to get this complex amount of information of what song the bird produced? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, so there is a very, there's a lot of uh, researchers uh, that study um, that study vocal production in birds, um, mostly using zebra finches. Um, and zebra finches are, are very different than starlings in that zebra finches learn a song when they're young. Um, and it's a fairly short, I mean, it's complex in terms of, of a lot of, you know, kind of motor behaviors generally, but it's, it's fa fairly short. It's maybe a second or two seconds, um, uh, a couple seconds long. And once they have learned it, they sing the exact same song for the rest of their life. Um, wow. So there's a little bit, I mean, there's like, there's a little bit of degradation, but you have to do like spectral analyses to identify it. But there's a little bit of degradation that they can do through their lives. Um, that is very nice, though, for studying the motor side of things, because basically you're kind of back down to an A-B test. So if you manipulate something, so if you lesion a part of the brain, and there's no effect of the song on the song, uh, but if you leash in a different part of the brain and there is an effect on the song, it's very because they sing the exact same song every single time. It's really easy to characterize that it's different, that it's changed, and that whatever you did caused an effect. Um, that would be much harder, although not impossible, but much harder to do with starlings because they sing such complex songs. So if they start seeing something different, is that simply because of something that you did or is that because um, they've pulled up a new element from their memory that they've um, that you've simply never observed before um, so on the perception side which is you know it, it's it's also a common 
it's also the fact that you know we're looking at and interested in different brain regions that we're looking at we're dealing with with largely perceptual stuff and asking you know what how is it that a bunch of cells in the brain are going to represent um uh represent something something meaningful for the animal um, and in many respects that's actually the part of the work that gets a little bit more into the data science stuff um because that's the that's the work you know actually analyzing um what the brain is doing is is really where we start start leveraging um, some of the machine learning and um, and some of the other kind of data that are out there. Okay, so what kind of data do you collect in your experience? Are you looking at response times, or of course, which button they press? But what what yeah. else do you collect? Yeah, so there's um so yeah, as far as the as the animal's behavior, it's largely what their what their response is, what the and what the response time is. And that gives us that gives us some uh, important uh, information. Um, the other things that we record is we record um, electrical signals from inside of their brains. So we can put um, we can put silicon um, silicon electrodes into their brains where we have basically thirty two um electrical sites that are are um they can pick up local electrical activity and by local el electrical activity i mean these sites are 177 square microns in diameter um so we can pick up uh so any given site is going to be able to pick up from uh, electrical activity within uh tens to hundreds of microns um so with that that those electrical signals um if if that if that recording site is nearby um, a neuron um, that is spiking and is active, when that neuron is active, it's going to send an electrical pulse off uh, down its axon to somewhere else in the brain to wherever it's connected. Um, what's nice for us is that that uh, that electrical pulse is very stereotyped. So um, for this particular um, and where my electrode is, every single time this this cell spikes, I'm going to get a very similar uh, shape, a very similar trace on my electrode. Um, and what we're particularly interested in is the times that these events are are happening. And so we can um, take that take that continuous electrical signal and basically do a detection algorithm and, and go through and detect all of these spiking events. And then we can use the shape of those events. Uh, in order to cluster and identify different cells, because a cell that's close is going to have a different waveform than a cell that's far away, um, and and so we can do some uh, some different uh, different clustering approaches in order to to infer what the uh, set of neurons is that we're observing. And how granular is that setup um, considered? You know, are you really capturing like most of what you would see in a bird's brain, or is it really like ideally you would love to have a lot more electrodes in there? Ideally, we would love to have a lot more electrodes. I mean, we've got you know, I mean, we're talking. Uh, I mean, I, I should know this number, but <laughs> there's probably in a, in the region that I'm interested in, there's probably hundreds of thousands of cells, and at any given time, I can probably get a couple dozen. Um, so, so we're definitely way undersampling the the entire population. Um, and yet, even with that undersampling, though, we can we can see we can see trends that um, that that emerge. Um, but there are some there. Are, I think one of the big the big open questions is what the coordinated activity of cells do. So a lot of times with these experiments. Um, we can, and this is true true of a lot of this kind of neuroscience, is that we we can observe, um, you know, I observe a set of cells on one day, and then a different set of cells on a different, just get collapsed into the same data set for the analysis. Um, but there's actually a lot of indicators that the joint activity and the activity, the simultaneous activity between cells matters a lot. Uh, so there's there's some particular questions out there. Um, that would necessitate larger data sets and a bigger un and um, and there's different ways of doing that. Some of those are constrained by um, by various aspects of the technology. Um, there are technological constraints in terms of the density of electrodes. 
Um, there's also other types of recording where you can um, take advantage of, um, of fluorescent indicators and actually film uh, under a microscope uh, film neurons that that have been um, have been genetically modified in order to uh, to light up when they spike. Uh, oh wow! Down to the cellular level, you'd be able to see that. Yeah, down to the cellular level, you can you can see that, um, and then you can and then you can actually take a video of a bunch of these cells, um, and you can and you can see each one uh, light up when it's um, when it uh, when it spikes. Um, and so those those technologies are available in in um, yeah the, the details of when of when one technology is possible over the other varies, but we're basically kind of at this point where I mean when I came into my when I came into my lab the very the very first set of recordings that I was doing um, I could basically record one cell at a time with just a single electrode with a single site and just in the in this lab, just in the um, the few years that I've been here, um, we're already up to 32 uh, sites. There are um, off the shelf. You can get um, you can get electrodes that are pushing 64 to 128 channels, um, and then there are um, kind of some electrodes that are in development that are still in kind of engineering labs that aren't aren't ready for a commercial purchase yet that are are pushing up into a thousand sites um, and so we're we're getting to the point that these these data sets are getting are getting much bigger and are going to become become more of a challenge for um, for analysis kind of the the typical set of tools that that most uh, most neuroscientists have been using in terms of just taking these taking these big data sets and loading them up into um, into into MATLAB or, or Python um, are is <laughs> pretty soon, um, and we're gonna have to say, start say that again. I think your more. audio cut out after loading the Python. Yeah, so a lot of the 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 trend for loading these data sets just into into a NumPy array in Python, or just loading it all up into an array in MATLAB, um, the data sets are just gonna get too big to be able to do any analysis like that. Um, and already, some labs are 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 pushing this. Um, and so there's some there's some cool tools that are getting developed out there, uh, very specifically for dealing with Spark. Uh, well, using Spark in order to analyze um, some of the data that we deal with. Uh, that's a platform by uh, Jeremy Freeman, um, and it's called Thunder. Um, and and yeah, so there's a couple other some people that are starting to look to to the tools that have been getting developed, you know, in the data science world and in the um, in industry. Um, to say, how can we start to use use these tools that in in neuroscience for the problems that that we're coming upon um, in a new way? So up until those problems started emerging, what were the main tools that you used, and are there mm -hmm. Python packages made specifically for this type of analysis? Yeah, there's some. You know, so I relied a lot. You know, I initially was trained up on MATLAB. Um, and I think that that's still probably where most people are is in is in MATLAB, um, and then there are also some. But then a few years ago, I switched over to to using Python exclusively, um, almost exclusively, and um, and yeah, and there's some very good there's some very good platform things out there in 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 Python. So there are some. I was talking about there's a package out there called Phi. Um, that that does some of this clustering very specifically for uh, for neuronal data, um, and there are. Um, but mostly, we kind of just use NumPy arrays and um, and loading up our our time series into into NumPy. Um, I've started relying a lot more on pandas the past couple of years. I like. Uh, I really like the the. Um, it's a very useful. Uh, a, a very useful set of uh, ways to represent uh, represent data. Once we're, I guess, we're, we kind of deal with two kinds of data. So basically, if you imagine like the trials that I was talking about, so an animal doing trials, and I've got trial data, um, that's the kind of data that works really really well in a, in a pandas array. When we're talking about um, you know these these recordings where we have these continuous waveforms across multiple channels. Um, that's a little bit yeah, less. Pandas is a little bit 
less useful there. Um, but once I've kind of transformed that and extracted the key pieces of information I want out of that and, and kind of summarize that in a nice way, dropping stuff into a pandas data frame um, is is has kind of been my 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 go to for for a few months or years now, somewhere in there. So um, this this is a very specific set set of skills and data and research that you're doing, and I guess a lot of PhD programs tend to be like that. Um, how transferable are these skills, and what kind of sense do you get in terms of do people usually go stay in academia and research or go into industry after doing this type of research? Yeah, so I think that the yeah, I think that a lot of times, I mean, so a lot of the kind of your your classic set, uh, in some respects, the skills are highly specific, but in some some respects, they're very broad. Um, so the challenges of cluster of doing regressions, um, you know, kind of these approaches are a lot of what we use to try to understand the data that we're dealing with. And so I think that as long as one is doing a PhD and and can see can see in some respect, um, I actually think it's it's not too hard to to translate these these things into new analyses. So you know, I was basically able to take these exact same uh, same sets of skills, and you know, I was working with a, a startup doing some market analysis, and so I was able to take a survey that they had done, and you know, kind of take the same sets of approaches to try to understand that survey data and. Um, I've, you know, messed around with my own kind of pet data sets that I've, I've found online and that I've scraped off of websites and such. And, um, and it's, and, and so I think in some respects, as long as you're, as long as you, as you learn stuff broadly and you're not just, um, you're not just applying the function that somebody handed to you, uh, to, um, to do your analysis, as long as you're thinking critically about, about why you're doing what you're doing and understanding what it's, what it's doing. Um, I actually think that it's the the skills are are more transferable than than one might expect. And you, you know, you've done a lot of math. You mentioned that you were good at math since you were young. Um, what advice do you have for people that want to go into this field? Also, well, first, how would you define your field? Is this cognitive? I mean, com <laughs> computational neuroscience? Yeah, I would say computational systems neuroscience. Computational, computational neuroscience, there's a little bit of assumption that you're doing theoretical work, that you're basically uh -huh. developing and, um, and and purely working with equations. Um, but yeah, this would be this would be on the on the kind of computational and systems neuroscience side of things. Um, experimental. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Experimentally driven, exactly. Yeah. So what, um, what, was what the first advice question? do you have for people that want to learn the, those things? Like say somebody's an undergrad now and they're interested in going into this field. I think the key thing at this point is the, the questions are a matter of, of getting experience um, and getting involved in research projects. Um, and for me, for this and, and you know, a lot of the data science you know, skills that I've developed is largely out of interest. Um, you know, I there are, you know, to a certain extent, you know, you need classes, and and it's worth it's worth noting when there are specific classes that will help you to to meet a need. But I've always been very um, very driven by my immediate needs. That I'll learn some, you know, if I have a, a problem that's in front of me, then I'll figure out what I need to learn in order to solve that problem. And that's been a, a really that's been a very effective way for me of of doing stuff. I I have a really I have a really hard time getting the motivation to do an analysis on a data set like, I don't know, the IRIS data set or something. Um, you know, like to just do an analysis on a data set because because a, a professor said that I should do this analysis on this data set. Um, I, I, find, I find it's really hard for me to be self-motivated in that framework. Um, yeah, I'm the same way. Well, and those data sets tend to be so clean, it's not realistic anyway. So, you know, with the exactly. Data Science Learning Club data, I actually worked with bird data, <laughs> funny uh -huh. enough, um, of migration. Uh, and the okay, Cornell yeah. Ornithology, they have an eBird data set where they take um, all these sightings of birds and, and you can get a lot of data from that. So what are, your, what are some of your um, favorite data sets? You mentioned you scraped some, so what kind of data do you usually play around with? Yeah, so I've got, so my wife is a, my wife is a birth doula. And oh wow! 
And we were we, we were recognizing that um, we were recognizing we realized that that um, what birth doulas charge varies a lot depending on where they are. So mm -hmm. um, here in Southern California, they get paid better than they do in um, Northern Arizona, for example. Um, and so this got me curious whether whether I whether whether there was anything out there about this. And so I actually. I don't have the, I've been, this is something, I've been waiting until I'm actually done with my PhD in order to, to really flesh this out and, and write up a blog post on it. Um, but I, but I, yeah, so like a year ago or so, I downloaded, I, I went to, found this website that was basically a bunch of reviews of doulas and doulas maintain profiles. Um, and so I went and, and scraped a bunch of profiles off of there and, um, dropped it into this big, ugly JSON file, and then went through and cleaned it up into a nice Pandas data frame that I could could start analyzing and looking at. Um, looking at um, both, you know, to what extent does uh, does a state uh, predict uh, what a doula is gonna charge, or is it, are there kind of, I've got a little bit, there's a little bit of indication that there might be kind of clusters of styles of doulas um, so it's kind of a fun data set that, that nobody else has, um, at least not until I'm done with it. And when I'm done with it, I'll probably push the data out too. Um, but, but yeah, I, having an interesting question, which is like, you know, determining what these, what doulas are charging, um, mm -hmm. and, and seeking out that saying like, okay, where can I get this data? You know, where is it? Um, and, and is there something interesting that I can find from this? I feel like a lot of the um, a lot of the sports people have been doing this for a while with with a lot of the um, the the fantasy sports stuff, right? Where you where you've got some goal to put together your your particular um, your particular roster, and so you go and and scrape the stats from some uh, from some website in order to get the stuff that that matters to you to to solve your problem that's in front of you. Um, yeah, and this is definitely something we've heard as a recurring theme on the podcast that so many data scientists just you learn what you need to learn in order to answer a certain question, you problem solve on the fly, um, you know, you yeah. have to be creative. And I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not just learning the tools and, and certain pieces of software or approaches. Um, it's kind of a, an all over like MacGyver of data. <laughs> being <able laughs> exactly. To pack things together from whatever you could find. Um, and it's very problem driven, problem solving driven. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's and that's exactly what I've you know what's been what's been so motivating for me in order to to learn these things is that is that problem solving. Yeah, so you mentioned that um, when you finish your PhD. So when is that going to be and what are your plan next plans? Yeah, so that should be here in the next uh, in the next couple months. Um, the, right. the yeah, no, I'm super excited. Um, and then I've got I'm uh, heading up to the Allen Institute in Seattle. And what is that? Um, and so the the Allen Institute is a is a is a neuroscience research institute. They're a little bit different than most. So most neuroscience research institutes are organized a little bit more similar to academia in that they are structured that they have a bunch of small groups that are doing research, um, largely kind of independently. Uh, the Allen Institute is a little bit more like it's almost like they're a nonprofit biotechnology company, in that they're main goal is basically to produce very large data sets um, for other neuroscientists to use. So for example, they have these uh, very large data sets of gene expression in the mouse brain. So for dozens and dozens of genes, they've gone through and, um, and uh, characterized uh, throughout many, many mice where in the in their brains these genes are um, are being expressed, and this basically is this a project like this. Excuse me. A project like this is basically this like, technical tour. It requires a lot of people to uh, to do the basic biology to make this happen. Um, it's a technical tour de force because you have to save all this data and you have to get your pipe your data production set up so that everything's co-registered appropriately. Um, but they have the resources and they're dedicated to doing this. Um, so the project that I'm going to be working on, I'm on kind of their their sort of their R&D side, which is a little bit more similar to a traditional academic lab. 
Um, but we're going to be doing, um, they've got a, a new project where I'd basically be working on kind of similar questions and similar problems as I am now. Like basically, if I have large, kind of the exact si kinds of questions you're asking me about when you have very large, if you, uh, large data sets of, of individual neurons um, that are, are active. Um, how do we characterize this? How does this, uh, you know, how can we get something interesting out of this? Um, but also all done with an eye towards scaling this up to be a very large project. So we'd have our kind of fairly small, relatively small, it would be much more similar to a typical research lab. Um, but with everything done, you know, in a, in a typical research lab, you know, I can, I can hack something together and, and hack some code together um, that nobody else is ever going to touch. Um, and, and that's kind of the de facto standard. Um, and I don't really have to think about whether it will work, um, you know, it, whether it will scale, whether it will do this or that. As long as I can get it to work for my stuff, that's good enough. And then, and then you go on to the next thing. Um, but one thing I'm really excited about at the Allen Institute is that, um, that the, the work will be done uh, largely to, with the goal of scaling this up to build a very large data product that, um, that can be useful much more broadly. And how did you get that position? You know, do they come to the different colleges and recruit people, or did you seek them out? And what was that interview process like? Yeah, that was um, so. The Allen Institute actually, um, the Allen Institute. I was uh, poking around on their website and <laughs> and um, submitted the. Um, I started the application, um, and the um, the hiring manager reached out to me. Um, and uh, where you know, by virtue of it being academia and and my the st stuff that I do is very similar, um, we uh, we had already known each other. Um, so he and I, I didn't even realize that he small was the world. one who was doing the hiring. Yeah, no, it's one of these small world things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so he he reached out to me, and um, and I went up and interviewed. And the interview was much more similar to was a pretty academic interview in that I went up, I gave a talk. I uh, basically spent a whole day um, interacting with the other people in the lab, uh, chatting with them about what they were doing, um, you know, having a, nice conversations about about interesting questions and and interesting places for the science to go. Um, so. Well, that's great. Okay, well, I think um, it's about time to wrap up. Do you have any last advice or resources or anything that you want to point people to that want to become a data scientist? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that, you know, one of my, yeah, I don't have any particular, particular resources. I mean, I think the, the I think one of the big things for me has largely been Twitter, um, and, and interacting with Twitter and following, uh, some of the, the right people on Twitter. I mean, I think that, I mean, you're obviously, uh, yeah. uh, a key node in the, in the data science world on Twitter. Um, well, thank you. And everybody that I've found for the podcast so far, I met on Twitter. So yeah, um, yeah. Twitter is definitely a good resource for learning data science. I think that that's really been, and I think that that's been the big thing for the, the big resource for me to figure out what what's data doing that academia is not. You know, what can I maybe do better and and pull into my own into my own daily work here that that will both make me a little bit more efficient with what I'm doing, but also kind of give me that set of skills that. Um, that that industry and uh, and people are going to be looking for um, if I go on the data science job market. So yeah, so it sounds like so far your advice is mostly go out there and get experience, and then also connect with yep. people on Twitter. All Absolutely, right, sounds good. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for talking with us today, Justin. Awesome. Um, this was a great interview, and a lot of people are going to get a lot from it. And I'm so glad to finally have had a neuroscientist on the podcast. <laughs> thanks for <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for um, agreeing to talk with us, and, and this was great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye.